Okay, thank you. All right, Peter, we're live, okay. actually. Very good. So let me greet people and uh, yeah, go well, ahead. Is everyone here? I mean, can everyone hear me? Let's see. Yes, we got Everyone some hands. Here? Okay, great. Um, any any just basic questions starting out? And I, I think I'm going to vary it a little bit. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you how I got started on, on my little um, memoir, uh, Uncle Rico's Encore. But any questions, you can either put it in the chat or or you can direct talk directly to me. Uh, any areas that you want to focus on. I, I've got a set schedule uh, that I typically use, but I, I'm more than happy to accommodate uh, the uh, particular needs of attendees. So um, uh, any hands up? Okay, Evelyn, go ahead. Go ahead and unmute. Oh, Hello. No, I I didn't have a question, but I have been writing memoir and I stopped because there was a point when the difficult things make me kind of unsettled. So I would like to address that. Yeah, well, I mean, um, the, 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 the problem with memoir, the challenge with memoir is, is that it has to be told in an honest fashion. Otherwise, the reader's not going uh, going to believe it. I mean, uh, you 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 have to uh, put it out there, uh, flaws and all. I mean, in terms of the protagonist, uh, and you're both writer and protagonist, right? You're the writer, and you're also the protagonist. Yes, and, and it's very difficult uh, uh, to to. And we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Um, to be completely honest, to lay it all out on the page. Um, and if you're not willing to do that, then then maybe memoir isn't the type of writing that you should be doing. Maybe you should be doing fiction, which which allows you to disguise some things. But memoirs can be very brutal that way. Yes, it can be very very brutal <laughs> um, because um, uh, the 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 reader's expectations are that this is uh, this is a, a true story. Okay, this is balance. This is. Uh, um, this is uh, the individual burying her soul, good points, bad points, um, you know, blessings and warts, all of that, all of that. Yes. Uh, so uh, don't feel bad and don't feel like you are the only one who's ever gone through this. I, I went through uh, a, a certain amount of this in terms of um, uh, um in terms of writing my collection of mini memoirs, I mean, there are points where I have to admit, yeah, I was really kind of an asshole, you know? Yep. Um, um, and not just kind of, but, um, uh, 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 you know, it's it's all laid out. You, you, you bet with memoir, it's like you hold up your wrist and, and, and you cut a vein or two. And it can be... Um, it can be exhilarating, it can be very satisfying, but it can also be very, very painful for the the writer who was also the protagonist. So 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 um does I'm hoping that that clarifies your 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 situation, um why you stopped and so on and so forth. I encourage you to gather up the strength uh, and and attack it again, though. If Thank you think it's a good Thank story. You. Gather up the strength. You're not going to be able to get it all done in 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 one fell swoop, because there are admissions of of, of probably weaknesses, flaws that that um, you know you have to process and and put on the page. Yes. So you're you're you won't be the only memoir writer who has had to do this. Believe me, you're not alone. <laughs> okay, this is a challenge each of us as as memoir writers and people who want to write their memoirs. Um, this is a challenge that that each of us faces. I know I had to face mine. And uh, let me let me. I, I was a, a fiction writer for for many many years, and uh, let me let me begin with my own backstory. 
Um, and um, the last uh, novel I had written, Leaving Esler, which I was very, very proud of, by the way, um, because I've written for small presses, university presses, and the like. I've only written one one book for, for a major press, but uh, uh, most of my publishers have been university presses and small presses. Well, I was very proud of that book. And um, it was a young adult novel, and uh, it was read by maybe three people. <laughs> <laughs> and they were all related to me, <laughs> carried my last name, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, I've had it. I've had it because uh, 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 fiction writing or writing books for me is, is uh, uh, you know, that that's a three-year commitment. Uh, it, it's, it, it's a tough wrestling match and, and you're, you're constantly on the go. Um, and, um, I said, I've had it. I've had it. Six books is enough. I think that's six books. That, that's that's enough. Um, but um, around about uh, 2018, the, I, I got an itch because 2018, uh, September 20th, 2018, um, marked a very significant, the 50th anniversary of, of probably the most significant day in my life. And that's when I reported to the induction center in Seattle for <laughs> for service in the U.S. Army. <laughs> I still remember that day. It happened uh, 50 years ago. And I said, I have to commemorate this. I have to commemorate this. I have to put it down on writing what I was feeling, what I was thinking uh, at the time. And um, it, it's about five pages. And I'll, I'll read that to you. For those of you who are thinking of, 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 of writing your own memoirs, begin with something small. I mean, that, that's basically my, my underlying advice. Uh, think of something small if you like it, it. It could be enough of a boost for you to keep writing. And that's, that's basically what it was. I, I submitted it to friends uh, who have, uh, uh, and, and, and professionals who had very, very good writing backgrounds. They, they knew good writing when they, when they saw it, and they liked it. And, and that was enough of an energy boost for me. Just keep on writing and, and to finally come up with this, right? Uncle Rico's Encore, a collection of, 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 of um, mini, mini memoirs, mostly true stories of Filipino Seattle. But let me read you this, how, how something small can lead to something that's not so small. And it's September 20th, 1968. Five little pages, and it leads to eventually over 200. September 20th, 1968. Could it really have been that long ago? The first day of my 18th year, and I am spending it at the Military Induction Center in Seattle. Me and other accidental boy soldiers filling out forms, taking tests, bending over, just bobbing along in a white fruit of the loom sea. I glanced around the room. Not many razors needed. I was a product of Catholic schools, deferred sexuality, and stations to the cross sublimation, a virgin. But I knew I wasn't the only one. I also knew that some of them weren't coming back. And on their tombstones, it should read, poor, poor, fill in the blank. The only titty ever sucked was his mom's. Was I scared? Too strong apprehensive that fits my road to the induction center started the year before in the spring of 1967 when i got a phone call from a high school pal steve aspiris we were juniors at the time the the vietnam war was too far down the road to worry about besides as a soon-to-be senior at o'day high i had more important things to worry about like a high hopes basketball season steve said he'd drive and we'd be joined by Ted Davina, Vince Pisaya, and Jean Navarro, the other three slightly older than Steve and me, their high school years, a chapter in their past. As we cruised the city's neighborhoods and headed downtown, we listened to R&B, just hanging out, an activity at which Filipino Americans of my day excelled. Among the, jo among the jokes and banter, the camaraderie, the comfort that comes with a common ethnic identity and a shared history, Jean suddenly dropped a bomb. 
He'd signed with the Marines, he said, his tone matter of fact. He'd be reporting to boot camp in a few days. Ted and Vince would be next, snatch up by the military. For all three, <clears throat> there was only one destination, Vietnam. That's when the war hit home. My time was coming. Gene, Vince, and Ted could have postponed military service by going to college with its life-saving four-year draft deferment. I was hoping to do that. But among too many of my Filipino peers, it wasn't an option. Our immigrant parents came from poverty. In America, they worked in the nation's underbelly, migrating to seasonal backbreaking jobs on farms and in salmon canneries. By the 1960s, their economic situation had improved, but not enough to send their sons to college. My friends also had unconsidered options like Canada, but I know what they would have said. Nope, that's what white guys did. Or how about growing their hair, burning their draft cards and protesting the war? Same thing. Then there was a stereotype prevalent among Seattle's white public high school teachers and counselors that unlike studious and well-behaved Japanese and Chinese boys, young Filipino males were just not college material. Try the post office, they were told, or learn a trade. Oh, and cut your hair, stop jaywalking, and pay taxes. They smoked, they drank, they talked smack to the ladies and slicked their hair. Homemade, of course, just like their dads. They brawled in the streets. They danced too black. College, 1967. Give me a break, brother man. That's what white guys did. It's not like Vietnam was the only thing I thought about. But when I did, I had a hard time seeing myself in Army Green. For starters, I hated the woods, never mind swamps, steamy jungles, rice paddies killer snakes, and pooping outside. Ditto for hiking and sleeping outdoors. Guns and loud noises scared me. Getting shot scared me more. Campfires without s'mores? Forget it. I felt lucky being not yet 17, which gave me more than a year of ongoing adolescence and perhaps enough time to figure things out. Besides, Maybe the war would be over by then. Plus, there were the distractions of senior year. The upcoming basketball season, college applications, and with a little luck, maybe even a girlfriend. Everything but the girlfriend went okay. We beat Seattle Prep, our bitter crosstown rival, and qualified for the playoffs, where we got bounced in the first game. I even got accepted despite an exceedingly modest academic record, to the University of Washington. But a girlfriend? I fell one win short of the triple crown. Graduation came and went, and I was three months away from turning 18. It was time to get serious about this Vietnam thing, a point driven home by our Filipino Summer League basketball team. As the season wore on, our guys, our guys kept disappearing, leaving for basic, leaving for war. Then one day in August, I decided to launch a preemptive strike. I would join the Army, but only under my terms. Sure, I had been accepted by the UW. My acceptance gave me the precious deferment, but how long I could hold on to it was another matter. The truth was that going to the university intimidated me. It was so impersonal, bloodless, soulless, and huge. A city within a city. And I was convinced I would flunk out and become meat for the body-hungry draft. And, like so many draftees, be sent to the bush to hike and shoot and poop outdoors. I told the recruiter I wanted to be in military intelligence where my ability to type and answer telephones, follow office etiquette, and politely brown-nosed superiors would be highly valued. I also wanted the six-month delayed entry program. It was my plan B after flunking out of the UW. He tried to talk me into the airborne. No thanks, I replied. I signed the paperwork, and on my birthday, I reported to the adduction center. 
At the end of what was becoming a tedious day, I had one more step in the process, a meeting with a medical officer. In a sense, I was relieved. This day would finally end. Plan B would be underway, and it would have been too. But earlier, I had filled out a form asking if I had a history of listed maladies or diseases. Asthma, I wrote, which was true. As a child, I'd even been hospitalized after a nasty attack. But I outgrew it and became the picture of teenage health, playing football in the fall, basketball in the winter, and baseball in the spring. I entered the doc's office. He was seated behind his desk and he motioned for me to sit down. As he scanned my medical history, I glanced at his features. Blonde hair with blue eyes. A handsome man who looked younger than his calendar years. He also looked kind, serene, like a priest who'd just been sitting at the right hand of God. He looked up and stared at me. I see you've had asthma, he said solemnly. Yes, I had it as a child. That means if you go to a hot, dusty place, there's a chance your asthma could act up. Hmm, I hadn't thought of that. My asthma acting up in a hot, dusty, and violent environment was the least of my worries. I was puzzled, unsure what the doc was getting at. Before I could reply, he repeated himself, slower and more firmly this time, like he was talking to an idiot. That means if you go to a hot, dusty place, ding, I realized he was trying to flunk me out. He was doing his best to give me my life. Yeah, I mumbled, sure. He sat back in his chair, the slightest of smiles forming at the corners of his mouth. I'm afraid you can't join the army, son. Sorry, you get a one Y instead. A one Y? It means you'll only serve if there's a national emergency. I got up to leave. This was so unexpected. I didn't know what to feel. Half a century later, I can't remember if I thanked him then, but I now know I should have. Because of that doc, I was able to continue in college, go to law school, and screw up a legal career and two out of three marriages. But why this kindness? Maybe it was because he knew that the war couldn't be won. Or maybe it was proof that God really does love fools. Or perhaps it was because the great cosmic joker, Senor Lucky Dog, chose my birthday to drop me a bone. Or maybe it all went deeper, that he knew the war shouldn't have been fought in the first place. Whatever the reason, I know he concluded that I'd be one more teenage discardable in this most dubious of battles. Ah, but the doc didn't know of plan B, that I'd carefully planned to sit out my tour in an office with air conditioning, or at least fans. But being 18 and very naive, I didn't realize that my best laid plan could gang after glay, easy enough in a war zone. Every morning for the last several years, I've smudged with tobacco and sage, praying for the well-being of those who are close to me. When his turn comes up, I see his face. This is my prayer. Thank you, Army Doc, who saved my life. So that was the start to the collection, something small. Okay, any comments? Or questions that students might have, or that as attendees might have. Okay, is um is uh, uh Abe uh, Abe are you still here? Okay, I'm going to show you something. This is this is an exercise. I think I can I I can. Okay, uh, this is an exercise, and I think I, I use it. I created it about 10, 15 years ago. I was on my uh uh. Uh, on on the road to uh, uh, Los Angeles, UCLA, and I was going to teach a, a CW workshop, a creative writing workshop. 
and um, um, it's called How to Start Building a Great Protagonist. And I use it for fiction writing, but I also use it for classes and memoir that I teach. Uh, and, and it forces uh, the writer. This is what uh, I think was Evelyn that I was chat chatting with earlier, uh, that you have to be honest. Uh, there's a hand up. Who is, uh, who's got the hand up? Yeah. Uh, Vince, go ahead. Don't mute yourself. Ah, there you go. Yeah. All right. Um, hello. Um, my name is Vince. And uh, hello, Mr. Bacho. Um, on Thursday, I was looking at the newsletter, and this is how I come to learn of your work uh, of the Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. And it just, and the picture that was on the newsletter caught me off guard. And it's because 30, Five years or so ago, in the Philippines, um, there was a man um, that looked so similar to you. Hmm. Could have been um, a, um, a my mo my mother, late mother told me that he was one of our relatives, and uh, he was. Um, I it's a vague recollection at this point because I've ne I haven't been in the Philippines for so long. Yeah, and, where where are your parents from? Um, um, actually, my grandparents were from Cebu. Oh, we're probably and, related, Vince. Could be, could be, yeah, could be. And he he gave me, um, whenever we went to the, oh, he was a, a bullet vendor, a dried fish vendor. Yeah, yeah. And we would talk to him, um, whenever we would go to, to go to the market, and he to, uh, he would always give me um a piece of um dried fish. Mm hmm. Um, um, my 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 mother's maiden last name was Bacho, but with a T. And there was like, and I've I've done some research on our, on our genealogy, and there have been some last name changes. Like um, yeah. they were dropped. So I was just caught off guard. To see a man who looks so alike from that man that I used to uh uh talk to and. Have a, have lost connection for all, after all these years because we migrated here in the United States. Yeah. Well, that, that's very very interesting. I guess it's kismet, right? I mean, <laughs> people yeah, yeah. people people uh, meet for at different times for different reasons. Thank you for bringing that up, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if if there is a blood link somewhere down the line. Anyway, this exercise here, and thank you, Vince, uh, is is something that I use in both when I teach fiction and when I teach creative nonfiction, which is basically what memoir is. And I'll ask my my colleague and, and moderator, um, Abe, to go ahead and run it. How to start building a great protagonist. Take notes and think through. And I'll ask questions at the end. Uh, think through. I mean, who are who is who is? Well, you're both the protagonist and and the narrator. But 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 what what did you learn uh, about yourself or? or or what do you need to do to to produce a, a protagonist slash narrator uh, who is really really um, who is really understandable, maybe even attractive to the readers? You you have to bring draw the readers in. One of the ways you do that is by the quality of your protagonist. Who's you? And 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 and. In in my memoir writing, you are the protagonist. But anyway, go ahead, uh, Gabe, Abe, Abe. I'm sorry, and run it. Oh, we need some sound. Sounds not coming through. Okay. Still no sound in.
I can. I think I can run it from my end if you want me to. There we go. A few years back, I was flying down to UCLA to teach a three-day gardener once compared courses in literature, quote, to a mildly good cocktail party picking up the good bits of food and conversation, end quote, and, quote, going home when it comes to seeing the reasonable thing to do, end quote. However, for those aspiring to be artists, and that's what most fiction writers aspire to be, the challenges they face are daunting. Quote, art at those moments when it feels most like art, when we feel most alive, most alert, most triumphant, is less like a cocktail party than a pool full of sharks, end of quote. An hour at sight of Burbank and I was starting to get worried, not over the landing, although I don't like landings much, but what to teach that would really grab my students' attention. Then I suddenly figured it out. Was it random inspiration or the two shots of Jack I always take before the plane lands? Or maybe on my way to the bathroom, I had caught a glimpse of Brad or Leonardo gracing the cover of one of those gossip rags. Whatever the reason, I stopped thinking about the writing workshop and began to think of big stars and their big paydays and why I was spending years laboring over manuscripts, even award winners, that would generate royalties measurable in peanuts, not cashews, pecans, and certainly not dollars. By the end of my envy-riddled and life-misspent imaginings, I had my workshop focus. I understood that Leonardo got the money because he's the one who drew people into the theaters. In a similar way, the protagonist is the star of the novel. The more interesting, the more fully developed the protagonist is, the more likely the reader is to continue turning pages. As the plane began its descent, I had a suspicion that many writers had modeled their main characters after themselves. And if that was true, then their biases would limit the range of their protagonists, resulting in characters who were determined, honest, vigilant, loyal, and eventually successful. Possessors of the whole spectrum of Girl Scout traits. It tends to favor a forward-moving, one-dimensional plot, the heroine's quest set in Santa Monica. Let's say our protagonist's dastardly husband has just left her for a younger woman after she had worked hard to put him through law school. She has two children and a pile of bills. At first, she's despondent and is drinking too much. But then, because of the love she has for her children and the respect she has for herself, she snaps out of it and puts herself through business school or whatever. She can't fail because the writer can't see her character or herself fail. One-dimensional characters tend to be boring. And multi-dimensional characters tend to be more interesting if for no other reason than they are less predictable. Let's use our Santa Monica heroine quest character. Let's say that along the way to graduating from business school, she's picked up some bad habits, like sleeping with married men, including a few of her professors. Messy, eh? But it opens up more plotting options, including the possibility that the protagonist may fail that might prove more interesting than the first storyline. By the time the plane was on the tarmac, I'd figured out both schedule and approach. When the workshop begins tomorrow, Friday, I will have my students tell me something about their protagonist. I will then have them psychologically become their protagonist, using their protagonist's own words to describe who they are. To do this effectively, they have to know everything about their character, how she looks, what she believes, how she speaks. On Saturday, their assignment will be to become the antagonist. In the scenario, the antagonist responds to what the protagonist has said about herself. Of course, to make this part of the exercise successful, students have to now psychologically become the antagonist and to respond to the truth or lack of truth in the protagonist's monologue. On Sunday, they will become the referee, a third party who knows both parties well and is able to discern the real truth about the protagonist. If the exercise is done honestly, if writers psychologically become the three different characters, the chance is good that at the end of the process, the protagonist will be more complex and, hopefully, better than the one originally imagined. It certainly worked that way in the workshop. On Sunday, tired students reported that they had lost sleep as they struggled with this new understanding of who their protagonists were. 
As to the exercise itself, I have no idea if other fiction teachers use this technique or have used this technique before I did. All I knew as I deplaned was that I had a plan to fill three workshop days. That Friday, as the members of the workshop gathered around a long table, I began the proceedings by asking one of my students, a slender Filipino woman in her mid-thirties, to describe her protagonist. She's 35, she began. A Filipina, slight build. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, now I want you to spend the next five minutes or so, five to ten minutes, um, going over your protagonist. Who is you in memoir? Okay, in fiction, is someone that you invent, but it's you in memoir. What are the strengths and weaknesses? And this is an exercise in vetting your character, right? I mean, no one likes a one-dimensional character. I mean, I, I get bored if I if I am not attracted to the main character, the protagonist in the work of fiction, or or in a memoir. I stop reading. It's like I, I'll I'll figure it out after two pages. So it's important uh, that that you create um, an honest protagonist who's also you. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? Et cetera, et cetera. And we will get back together. Uh, I will chat. And this is to everyone. It's 12.34 now. Let's get back together at 12.40. Okay? And then uh, uh, hopefully people will have something to say. This is an exercise that took, um, uh, you know, it took two days to do. And uh, it's not realistic, if, you know, <laughs> try try this uh, with, with a, with a two-hour workshop. That's not going to happen. But I, I will be off it. I, 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 you will, you will, you, you have an assignment. Create your protagonist. W weigh the strengths and the weaknesses. Uh, and the protagonist is you. In memoir, it's you. Okay. In, in fiction, it's someone that you invent. So we will reconvene at twelve forty. Twelve forty. And then talk to me. Aha, the bedroom. It seems to be going really well. Mm -hmm. It's going very nicely. Mm -hmm.
All right, two more minutes. One minute. Okay, 1240, session's back. Uh, Alistair, why don't you talk to me about your, your character, your, your protagonist, or anyone who wants to volunteer. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't mind. Um, so my protagonist, I don't know if you'll, you'll like him off the bat, but should I just read what I wrote? Yeah, go ahead. He grew up with a lot of comments about how handsome he was, but his father nicknamed him Ugly Boy although maybe it was predated by the nickname Little Boy, and when he was in the mood, My Little Boy. The neat and tidy version is that he followed in his father's footsteps, first majoring in economics in college, and then eventually pursuing law studies. In 2024, now he's a government attorney. Although he took a short segue into private practice, he now finds himself a public servant, much like his father, who spent his entire legal career in government. Okay, what uh, what else about him? What are his strengths and weaknesses? Strengths and weaknesses. I yeah. guess. I mean, you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to resolve that issue now. Are you planning on writing a memoir? I am. Okay. You um, have to give it heavy thought in terms of what his strengths and weaknesses are in terms of telling the story, because no one is perfect, and um, and and. and uh, this is this is one of the preliminary things. The, the writers of memoir or writers of fiction uh, uh, should should always undertake. Okay, but it's a good start. I mean, in terms of describing him, good. Evelyn, how about you? I I have been trying to write about my childhood. Mm -hmm. So I just wrote words to describe me as a child. Okay, would you like to share? Smart, wily, afraid, survival first, dreamer, no compassion, saved by books, unkempt, love, hate in her heart, hope locked in, but yearns to escape, foul mouth but loves to play with the English language, mean, cruel, protected by the nuns, reluctant devil worshiper at home, <laughs> reluctant Jesus worshiper in Catholic school. And that's where I stopped. Very interesting character. Very, a very interesting character. Good, 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 good. Um. And each of them uh, has has a potential storyline, has has probably a part in 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 what the final product will look like. I yeah, I've been, yeah, 
she's she's not always you know a sweet little girl mm -hmm. okay good Re reading uh, stories about sweet little girls is like the most boring thing i could possibly think of <laughs> <laughs> okay vince how about you well what i have is born to philippines moved to san francisco california when he was 13 bit of a nerd a while growing up speaks Cebuano, Tagalog, and Filipino, learned Japanese um, in high school due to language, uh, you know, language um, curiosities and as a part of a requirement for school. Okay. Grew up kind of um, to told that he was a, a bright student, but in real life, a real bugo or a real dum-dum. Um, and it, it was because a grandfather was saying, well, was trying to coax him from out of his books, out of the, out of um, the school system, but he just could not see um, the world for what it is. Uh, lives in, in, in his head most of the time, thinks that everything is a, is a, is perfect. When in reality, it, it's not all black and white. English has been a struggle all these years. Um, struggled with an accent for a long time. Um, and that's what what about... Right so that's a good I start. Thought. That's a good start. You, you, you're you starting on a very complex character. It's the complexity of, of human beings, basically. You know, uh, the, that, that you're trying to capture here. Um, and, uh, uh, you know... As as characters, we're not just one dimensional. This is this is the purpose of the exercise. I have one way of doing it uh, through the protagonist exercise. Um, you may use that. You may not use that. That's fine. But but um, uh, you know, do not do one one dimensional characters. Avoid them at all costs. Okay, we have uh, time for couple... yeah. Go ahead. But, uh, the question I do have is um, I've been writing like journals journals um like for some time now. And everything is, it's like a, it's a, you know, I don't know where to go with, with my life story. And that has been the struggle that I've been having when, when writing. When it's reality that I'm trying to put on the page, everything just kind of wants to go everywhere. So how do you exactly, like, pick and choose which ones to, you know, put in a, an actual memoir that would be palpable to audiences, to readers? Which one is the most important? Which is the most significant? That's what you. That's that's what that that's what gets the most attention. What is the most important one to you? Not necessarily what's the most important to the audience, but what is the most important one to you? Because a memoir uh, is a story of your life, right? Right. right. What is the most important of of of, of its developments to you? That's what you focus on, okay. and why. Well, that's the thing. I'm, I'm still at the point where I'm like not, I'm not as, I don't have, I'm not advanced in years. Just let's just put it lightly. So I don't, maybe I'll just keep doing it until I, you know, I'm in my, eighties or something or seventies when I, when I finally have enough um life backstory to, I, I don't know. I'm just I don't, I don't know what to do with that. To be honest with you. Well, you and know, that, you don't have to wait that long. I mean, if, if, if the quality of writing is good enough, the story is interesting enough, um, then then send it out for publication is what I'm saying. I mean, there, there's no there, there's no age limit as to when uh, a person can write, uh, although older people tend to love to write memoirs. And I ca categorize myself as an older person. Oh, that's one I haven't tried yet, you know, writing a memoir. Uh, and I've lived long enough and so on and so forth. But younger people are fully capable of, of writing, doing excellent work in, in, in terms of memoir. So if you think it's good enough, then go with, go with it. I mean, dedicate yourself to it, to telling the story. And um, the other question would be, I want to dedicate, or I want to pepper it in with, with Zubano because I I've, I've haven't really seen any books um, that deal with the language. Mm -hmm. And I was was wondering, I mean, I've, I've seen um, comics that have um, that are bilingual, even trilingual, and in some, in they would just basically put things in parentheses or in in brackets. Yeah. Um, is there is there a um 
uh, is there a place for that in 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 a, in a memoir? In a memoir? Uh, 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 you're asking, you're asking, you know, I mean, uh, what about Cebuano, right? Uh, right. Uh, are, 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 are you, are you going to be writing it in Bisayan? That's my, um, that was one of the things that I was trying to think about just to just put it out there that the, this language exists. But um, I was also thinking about the audience and how much of an audience this would garner if I did have, if I did have it in that language. Or Not much here in the like U.S., but maybe you know in, in the Bisayas, yeah, maybe. And are there publishers in Cebu? I mean, it's, the last time I was there was over forty years ago, and it was a relative, not a small town, but it's a medium-sized town city by then. And, and and from what I've heard, and from the pictures that I've seen, the comments that people who visited, it's it's now a major metropolitan area. So it's, it it is. Are there publishers in, 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 in Cebu? That's a question you should ask and, and find an answer to. I've, I've seen um, University of Bohol, which, which also deals with um, Cebu. Yeah. That's the only one that I know of, but, you know. Um, that publishes, publishes work? Yes, publishes work. Okay, in, okay. well, it's worth, it's worth exploring and it's worth uh, creating a conversation with. You, you, you contact them directly via email. I'm sure they'll get back to you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Tell them what your plans are, and then and then uh, see if they can be of any assistance. But for the U.S. market, the answer is no. Okay. Uh, do I use uh, Bisayan words in, in in in? Well, actually, in 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 my collection of mini memoirs, uh, yeah. But it's also within context. There is a word that I use, anugon. Remember, anugon. It's a waste, right? Yeah. Anugon, mm -hmm. and then it has to do. <laughs> It has to do with um, uh, 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 it has to do with uh, the, the 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 military's assassination of, of three villagers um, uh, in in Samar in, in a town called Taft, uh, and and why one person that I knew uh, a, a very pretty young woman. Uh, who was with me at the time, why why she wasn't killed also. And uh, I'm thinking, the context is that I'm thinking the, the, the colonel who commanded the garrison there, and, and there was a fiesta, you know, this is one night when they weren't killing anyone. Uh, and uh, he had asked her to, to come dance with him, to be, the, you know, the guest of the ball. And, and so she did. And so I'm thinking that the, the colonel is saying, God, it would be so anugun to kill this beautiful young woman who is so stupid to be here in this in this war torn place. Um, it, it's within that context, okay. I will use Bisayan words uh, within the context of, of English stories, but it's always within the context so that the reader can understand what those words are. I have time for one more. Then I'm gonna then I'm gonna go to something else. How about Anne? Anne, you 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 have. Um, did did you were you able to get into the exercise? Anyone or anyone else who wants to go? Or Cindy? Anyone? See, are there hands up? How about Sally? Sally, you want to go? Oh, Evelyn, uh, you have your hand up. Only quick comment. Um, yeah. More because of I grew up in the mission as speaking Spanish, it's peppered with Spanish language. Yeah, it wouldn't be my memoir if it if it wasn't. So I I would encourage you know the anyone who grew up with different languages to use it and love it yeah. and include it because it's part of you. Yeah, I agree. Um uh, and. The thing is, is as long as you put it within context, uh, you you don't even have to, you don't ha even have to uh, uh, lay out what it means exactly. The reader, a, a sharp reader, will be able to figure it out. Okay, good point, Sheila. Go ahead, your hands up. Go ahead, Just Sheila. One second. <clears throat> I'm on my misbehaving phone, so. Oh, okay, that's all right. Misbehaving phones are, are part of a uh, part part of the Zoom experience. Yeah. Okay, I I picked something actually that I I've, I've been rewriting it. It's not new. I didn't just do it in the last ten minutes. Mm -hmm. um, 
But my main question for listeners is whether the character is even interesting enough as it is to to further embellish it. Is it interesting to you? Is the uh, character today? interesting to you? Yeah. They've written it otherwise. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Grandpa I mean, a... seems like a name you'd give to an affable, comfortable sort of grandfather. Yeah. Really, I'm not sure he was that at all. I do know when he passed away in his sleep, in his usual comfortable armchair in front of the fire, the general consensus seemed to be he had not deserved to go so peaceably. What I was certain of was that he would religiously give me for my birthday and at Christmas a book and a silver dollar. The silver dollars were no doubt intended to bind me to my Virginia City heritage. Grandpa Joe, having been a self-styled mining engineer, himself minted in Nevada's Comstock Road. Okay, I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, how much backstory are you going to tell about your grandpa? I'm sorry, how much backstory? Yeah, yeah. He, he seems uh, on, on the surface to be a very interesting character. The reader's going to want no, want to know more about, about uh, this recently departed mm -hmm. character. Um, well, I have a, a it's kind of a, a mishmash. I have several separate pieces, some of which are still circulating in my head. Mm -hmm. Many of which are actually written already. Yeah, that that all have to do with why Grandpa Joe's father left Ireland, ended up in Virginia City, etc. Talks about the family house and etc. So there, there is, uh, there is story there that is background. It's yeah. just not this particular piece. I'm wondering specifically whether I should have more of a physical description of him that you know the, the more that you can create a visual of an individual what you want to do both as a memoir writer and as a fiction writer uh is put the the reader on the page okay you see what as, as the reader wants to see what the characters see okay um uh, bring the page alive i tell uh writers in both my my fiction writing and creative nonfiction writing class i.e my memoir class that you with a pad of paper and a pen can create a scene as visual as anything you have ever seen on the screen. One of the most visual and, and, and graphic memorable scenes for me at least was the landing at Normandy uh, and saving Private Ryan. It was just amazing scene. But uh, I, I tell my students that um, you you can do you you can do the same thing with pad and a pad of paper and pen and and, and they said what well, and they're doubtful and, said, and they say uh they ask how do you do that i said it's a choice of words it's the choice of words that you use if i say car or vehicle it could be any car any vehicle it doesn't resonate but if i say cherried out 1957 chev everyone knows what that looks like or at least people of a certain age know we know what that looks like we get the color of course it's going to be red right uh we we get whether it's a hard top or or, or, or soft top of course it's a convertible we get a sense of the interior bucket seats or, or or bench seats for those old enough to remember what bench seats look like of course they're bucket seats what's the color white uh what's it made of leather Okay, and then you get to the wheels. Uh, and of course, they're white walls. Well, are they big ones or are they little skinny? Of course, they're big ones. Okay, you, you can create the visual with your choice of words. Okay, and that's something that, that writers all, when, when, when it comes to a choice of choosing a word, vehicle or car, vehicle or 57 Chev, you always go with the words that are more specific because you want to create in the reader's mind that little movie scene and you're sitting there in a the theater you're watching it oh wow so that's what the writer is writing about okay if you do that you've got half the battle won okay okay let, let's go into a definition uh, of what a memoir is it is the writer's recollection of an important moment or moments and his or her interpretation of that moment or moments 
effective writers, and this is something that, that uh, I hope you take away from this particular session, the same they use the same skills as a fi effective fiction writers. Same skills. These are storytelling skills, right? Memoir is not an essay. And why do beginning memoir creative nonfiction writers write in essay form? Because it is the form of writing that we are all taught since first grade. It's easy enough. It's predictable. But it's not an essay. Okay? It's not explaining. It, it, the, the purpose of, 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 of memoir as well as fiction is to evoke Okay, a vocal reaction in, in, in the reader is not necessarily to explain things through the use of, 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 of ponderous detail. Um, let's see, it's storytelling. Okay, now, let me, let me, okay, there's a hand up. Who's got the hand? Evelyn, was that you again? Uh, Sheila? I've got a hand up. Sheila or Evelyn. Sheila and Evelyn both have hands up. <laughs> okay, well, I guess... Uh, Mine was a goof. What's that? Mine was a goof. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. And mine was a leftover. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Let me, let me read you a passage. And then you do this... You, you bring a scene alive with dialogue and action, okay? Um, fiction writers use it, memoir, good, good memoir writers use it as well. This is from fiction. Uh, I'll read to you a passage from a scene in my young adult novel that no one read, uh, Leaving Esla, which I'm really fond of, by the way. Uh, I gotta find it first. I'll be right back with it. Okay, I've got it. This is a scene where, um, uh, Antonio and his wife Eula. They, they, Yesler is is uh, the name of a famous housing project uh, in 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 Seattle, and um, there's there's a family of four: father, mother, and two sons. Um, Eula, the mother who who is half black, uh, she dies from cancer, but but she wants to make sure that uh, Bobby. Uh, the younger son is uh, has an, enough uh, skills uh, to survive uh, the projects, and um, she she makes Mariano promise her husband th that he will take care of her. Mariano had been a boxer, so she so he so he takes Bobby down to the gym. Bobby is is an introvert, a very delicate child, um, and he's also not. Um, Mariano's biological son, uh, Eula, the mother, had had an affair uh, with with a musician one night, and and Bobby was the outcome. Uh, but over the years, Mariano had come to love Bobby as his own son, and and so he's very protective of him, and and he 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 takes him down to the gym, and it turns out Bobby's pretty good. I mean, he's he's. He's got natural skills. He's quick on his feet. He's got quick hands. He's not the hardest hitter as a boxer, as a fighter, but uh, he, he's elusive and, and he makes people look kind of stupid when they try to hit him. Anyway, uh, the old trainer, uh, Mariano, comes up and, and recognizing Bobby's talent, he's, he's going to ask uh, the father uh, for, for permission uh, to, to have him become a fighter first amateur and then eventually professional and um the scene takes place in their apartment uh in the yesler terrace projects
Okay. And and uh, the the father Antonio says about Bobby turning pro. He's not sure. The sound of the voice startled Mario. Sure, it was a message, just not the one he wanted to hear. He turned slowly toward the messenger and shrugged. Guess you're right, Antonio, he said. You know, it was different back then, Dad began. You and me fight because we have to. Not so much for young guys nowadays. Times change. It's easier. Bobby's going to go to college, and if he fights, it's because he won a real bat. Mariano nodded and slowly started to rise. He walked over to Bobby's father, who was still seated. Good to see you, he said, before putting his hand on his old friend's shoulder. He then turned to Bobby. You know where to find me, Sonny. Every day, even Sunday. Yes, Uncle, yeah. Bobby answered. Mariano smiled. Your dad's proud of you. He says you're a good boy. I think he's right. Bobby blushed and turned away. Before he could respond, Mariano was already out of the kitchen and down the hall, the last sounds being those of a door quickly opened and closed. Bobby fidgeted slightly, wondering how Dad really felt. Like Mariano, boxing had made him more than he otherwise would have been. It had also brought him mom, like father, like son, like countless other fathers and sons. Were those his expectations? God, he hoped not. So, what do you think, Bobby finally said. His father shrugged. Nothing, really. What do you mean? Antonio turned slightly toward his son. He sighed and silently wished he had spent more time with him as he was growing up. But the boy preferred being with Eula. Bobby's just different, his wife would say. So he'd focus his attention on Polly, who was handful enough and so much more like him. The old man studied Bobby's smooth, unmarked features and recalled a moment almost 18 years ago when he first held him in Columbus Hospital. He was struck by the boy's delicate beauty, by his long eyelashes and large brown eyes and realized immediately that it was both blessing and curse. Over the years, the equation had not changed. He had thought then, and was thinking now, that such a handsome face, so like his wife's and so unlike his own, should never be cut or even bruised. At least not in the ring, where hard men regularly dished out cuts and bruises, sometimes even death or permanent injury. For fighters, the risks were just part of the game. I mean, you're almost a man and you're going to have to choose on this and everything else, his father began. For me, I like boxing. He then chuckled and pointed at his nose, broken more times than he could recall. Besides, I got the face for it. But that's just me, maybe not you. Mariano's right. You're a good boy and I'm already proud of you. And what you decide, decide to do won't change a thing. His father's words touched him, and for a moment he thought of going over to hug him. But no, Dad had never been the hugging type. At least not with Polly and him. Hugging was Mom's job. In that sense, the old man was like a lot of the other Filipino dads he knew. All dedicated non-huggers. Something he promised himself he would never become. He figured that the small and large defeats endured decades ago and over time had taught Antonio and his friends to go easy on affection, even with their kids. But love? Sure, Bobby knew it was there in the bottle, just with the cork screwed down tight. He suddenly decided it was time to loosen it a little. Thanks, Dad, he whispered, then paused before adding, I love you. Three simple words, the simplest of sentences, a not-so-simple response. Antonio, blinking hard, looked away, leaving Bobby to wonder if the strength of their bond was best left unspoken. But he felt it, and he knew in his bones his father did, too. Bobby couldn't have known that Antonio was suddenly remembering a time before he was born. 
when he and Eula had bitterly argued, and he'd asked her to give up this child. For him, the pictures and sounds were still painfully clear. Then as the boy grew, he recalled hearing the whispers and titters from neighbors, leaving him embarrassed, a shrunken man, and wondering whether he should have been firmer, more adamant with his wife. He wondered then if he'd made a mistake, if he should have drawn a him or me line when he could have and dared her to cross it. That was all such a long time ago, but not long enough to block rivulets of shame from seeping out of the folds and corners of memory, soon forming a wave that swept over him. And over that time, he'd also come to love this boy as he loved Polly. But no matter, in his mind it didn't make right what he had once felt. Face flushed, the old man couldn't stop blinking as he composed another simple sentence in his mind, deciding to add two words to Bobby's three-word declaration. Antonio, eyes still blinking, cleared his throat. I love you too, son. Can you see the scene? Can you hear the voices? Can you see the scene? Alistair, can you see the scene? Yes. Okay. What brings the scene alive is, is, is the dialogue. Okay? Is the dialogue. Okay? Um, dialogue, I mean, you have dialogue on film, right? So, I mean, why shouldn't writers use dialogue? You want to hear these characters. You want to hear their voices. You want to hear how they speak. Dialogue and action, these are the key ingredients to any sort of creative writing, whether you're talking about fiction or creative nonfiction. So let's go about 15 minutes creating scenes. Some of you have already done the writing, okay? Create a scene in which people are acting and speaking to each other. Try to make sure that the people speak differently, okay? Not everyone sounds the same. Not everyone sounds the same. And, and you have to set it in, in, the, in the reader's mind uh, without identifying it. It should be that clear that, oh, John is speaking here. Uh, Roberto is speaking here. Maria is speaking in this scene. The the, 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 the the matter the manner of speech should, should be so clear and distinct that, that people know automatically without using uh, Maria said that this is Maria that is speaking. So see if you can do that. Take um, you know some of you have already been writing. Now take a scene in which you you are writing in expository style and turn it into one that involves action and dialogue. We will get back together at 125, 125. And then you will read.
Evelyn, you have your hand up. Go ahead and unmute if you want to chat about it. No. Nope. Okay. No, no, I keep, I keep. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm writing. I'm writing. Okay. Then you'll share when, when we get back together in two minutes. One minute. Okay, Evelyn, let's start with you. What, what do you got? Um, despiértate, despiértate. Rough shakes. Mommy, mommy, que pasa? It's time, almost midnight. We have no money. Only my friend, only mi amigo can help us. No, mommy, no, no quiero. Tengo miedo. I'm scared of the devil. Get, hush, get dressed now. There's no money for your school. We need him. So cold, so dark. We stumble down the stairs into the garage. Damp, musty. She pulls me behind. Mommy, please, no. She shakes me hard. Cállate, maldita. O te mato aquí. In this moment, I shut up. She lights the black candle, closes her eyes, sways, chants. Oíme, Satanás. Lucifer, oíme, mi amigo, mi salvación. So I have to write. Very nice. I like that. Um, I didn't so didn't realize that the, uh, the 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 friend was the devil. That was very good. Uh, that 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 was it. Was been hard to write about going down to the yeah. basement and asking the devil for, but the money somehow materialized. Oh, you got a heavy topic there. Yeah. That nice dialogue. I like the dialogue. Uh, what I might do um, uh, is is you, you and, and you intersperse. Uh, I I might balance the dialogue in the beginning where it's just the mother and and the child talking with with uh, with 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 narrative. I'm describing, for example, when when the mother says she says Kalmate, right? Excelencia, calmate. Cállate, shut up. Cállate, okay. Cállate. Uh, and from from the child's perspective, what does the mother's face look like when she says cállate? Right. I might I I might not just focus on dialogue, but also uh, insert um, a little bit of narrative. I mean, that's that a mother saying shut up to her child. It's like, oh man. I mean, she's obviously very stressed out. Give um, the dialogue is very good, but give, 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 give the reader a, a, just a little bit more description. Maybe her eyes disappear when she says it. When she says it, right? Her eyes just kind of shut up, and there's tension lines on her forehead. 
or something along those lines, right? Callate. And that was good. That was good. That was good. I, uh, the scene was spooky enough, and uh, it was very visual. Uh, and I, I could hear the voices. So good job. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good job. Who else wants to share? Anyone want to share? Judy, you want to share? Kathy? Madeline? Any of you folks? Not required, but uh, we'd we'll like to see some hands up. Okay, there are two hands that I see. Three hands now. Okay, who are the ones? Shelly, go ahead. Sally, go ahead. And Anne, go ahead. Sally, go ahead first. Go ahead and uh, unmute. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Perfectly. Okay, good. Um, I wasn't sure how to do that. Okay. Um, I'm in the library right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you can whisper it out to us. Okay. Can you hear good no, enough? Absolutely. Okay. I okay. can hear you perfectly. Okay. I'll give you a hundred. She's doing it again, she thought. Money, it never makes a difference. Could you cash out 40 to my friend's girlfriend and put 60 on my books? It's not for drugs. I just owe my friend. One time deal, Dan. Don't ask me again. Do they have drugs there, she wonders. She doesn't know a lot about how all this works. Tired of being the drug detective. We have to buy our own underwear. This is the worst jail I've ever been in. It's cold at night. It's cement. It's cold. He knows she won't like that. She pictures them sleeping with no underwear. How do they wash underwear there? Before he left last summer, he had. Uh, she found a blue metal cigarette case he had dropped, well organized with brown resin wrapped in plastic on one side and white powder in micro baggies on the other. She watched him for a few hours search in and out of the house. That's where he lives, she thought. That's his house, that's his car, that's his girlfriend, that's his mom. So much in that blue metal case that fits in his pocket. That's all I got. <laughs> Very good, I mean, it's a nice balance of dialogue and narrative. You're always, you're always searching for that nice, Nice balance. I mean, if I if I go, for example, if I go two or three pages of, of narrative, uh, I always get suspicious. Uh, am I over relying on narrative? Can dialogue instead be used to carry a scene or a mini scene uh, within these three pages of narrative? Sometimes uh, I, I will I will decide that the narrative is fine the way it is. Uh, but as writers, uh, when you see yourself uh your your work uh starting to resemble an essay um th that's when you should at least ask the question can can some of this be carried by dialogue um and, and not not be so reliant upon uh narrative or the essay format of of expression okay good i think i think that struck the the, the right balance okay and go ahead Okay, and you're there. Well, go ahead and unmute. Uh, there you go. Okay, there we are. There we are. Okay, help me understand why your life is so much harder than mine. Don't we both have pain to spare? Asked Lizzie, the blonde, slightly older sister. The two women, born just 16 months apart, had so many things in common when it came to a shared past, particularly the wounds, the slights, and the difficulties of a shared childhood. Lizzie stood in the kitchen, emptying the dishwasher and keeping herself otherwise busy. Holly stretched out on the sofa, scrolling on the phone and looking disinterested. 
I don't know, whined Holly. Rob is just, uh. Rob was Holly's husband of 30 plus years. Their relationship had endured where others hadn't. Not because either spouse worked at making their marriage stronger, more likely because neither one wanted to deal with the idea of a divorce. They were similarly focused on their stores and raising their two children. The stores provided them with a nice lifestyle. The early years had been hard, and now they were able to enjoy a few of the finer things, furnishings, a vacation home, top-level cars. Holly continued, it's not fair. Rob buys whatever he wants. I still have to pay the vet bills for the dogs and save for retirement and tuition. Their vastly differing attitudes toward money was not a new issue in Lizzie's mind. She thought, whatever happens in their marriage is their business. Something about it must work at some level because they're still together. Is this why she dreaded the idea of marrying? Lizzie reminded Holly, well, I moved cross country to help care for mom and dad without any help from you. Both of their parents had passed away in November, 2022. Lizzie was still reeling from the shock of it and the relief of no longer bearing the burden of looking after them. She continued, my relationship went down the tube. I haven't had a full-time job for nearly two years. Being single and jobless is no picnic. Good. That, 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 you know, it, it's it's it, it's a good mix of, of, of backstory, narrative, and, and dialogue. That's good. Okay. Enjoyed it. Um, there's one more. Uh, Patricia, I think it is. Yeah, it's Patricia. Okay. Go ahead. This is just off the top of my head. This is not something. This I is heard. fine. This is fine. Don't you can't. <laughs> you're not um, going to master something. You know, in a, in in a two hour. Uh, seminar, but to go ahead, talk to you. Is, is just five places to start. It is something that was inspired by a photograph which um, triggered some memories. Um, Christmas Day in my grandparents' living room, my my father, my mother, my grandfather, me, and my little brother all standing ramrod stiff and unsmiling next to the tree, all except my little brother who's screwing up his eyes and grinning as if imagining adventures involving the yellow plastic rocket that he holds. Enthusi enthusiastic about photography, uh, because of a class that, which I'd been learning at school, I wanted to take my own picture. As my grandmother put down her Instamatic, I dashed to the bedroom to get my new Pentax. I would do something black and white, artistic and socially revealing. Where do you want us to stand? Asked my grandfather, moving toward the fireplace. My mother ran her fingers through my little brother's hair. No, barked my father. We're not going to do that. What do you mean? Why not? I pulled the Pentax to my eye anyway, considering framing and light. Don't you see Marjorie? She wants to make us look, make fun of us, make us look old fashioned and silly. What? Come on. That's not fair. I was outraged. In truth, I did want to reveal something conventional, middle class, and unflattering. <laughs> that was good. Um, yeah, again, you know, you're 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 just just work with dialogue because you people are very hesitant. Um, uh, beginning writers are very hesitant to work with dialogue because uh, uh, it's so. Uh, different from you know traditional form the traditional form of expository writing and I, I have to almost browbeat uh, my students to force them to use dialogue but but you're comfortable with it and so that's a good thing uh, experiment with it some more as as, as you're continuing uh, uh, the progress on your on your project and I hope it's a memoir um Here's a tension building exercise, and and it's good for for for, for fiction writers, and, and is as just as good for memoir writers. Remember, I start with the premise that that fiction writers and creative nonfiction writers use the same technique. So what I teach in fiction, I also teach it when I'm when I'm assigned to a class uh, in memoir. You you're going to use the same kind of story storytelling. Both both forms are storytelling. 
and, and you 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 can't tell a good story uh, without the use of, of of these 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 techniques that are typically associated with fiction. They're they're just as they're just as integral to uh, to, to a successful memoir as they are to a successful novel. So tension building, yeah, it applies in fiction, obviously, um, but it also applies in memoir. And and here is the exercise. Tension building exercises. It is in the chat. Okay. Tension building exercise. Describe a lake as seen by a young man who has just committed murder. Do not mention the murder. This is a foreshadowing element here, right? Uh, that 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 you you know the reader instinctively knows. Hold it a second. Something is not right here. Just by just by the description of the lake, I and mean, it's going to be done entirely as a narrative, right? Just by the description of the lake, something is off here. Use your imagination, and let's get back here. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get much done in eleven minutes, but let's try anyway. <laughs> let's get back here at uh, what time is it now? One fifty. One fifty. So we'll have a chance for for people to to. Sh see what they come up with in, in about 11 minutes. Good luck. I'm a step away. I'm a step away just for a second. Okay. Get to work.
Three minutes. Two minutes. One minute. Okay, let's get started. Um, I'll hold uh, some Q and A afterwards too. If we get go a little bit beyond two o'clock, I'm okay with that. That's not a big deal. It's not going to kill me. Who wants to volunteer? One hand up. Who is the hand? Let's see. Uh, Anne, go ahead. Hi. The sun reflected off the surface of the lake, so much so that the man squinted, just gazing across the water. He knew the water was more than 50 feet deep out there in the middle. It was cold at that depth. He gazed across and noticed three canoes, maybe rowboats in the distance. They seemed to glide, albeit in slow motion near the opposite shore. He tried counting, but couldn't focus. Were there 10 or was it 11 small bodies occupying those canoes? Small bodies. Such small bodies. He thought he heard chatter and an occasional squeal from the canoes. They were full of life. Was there a cloud bank passing overhead? Whereas he'd been sweating in the sunshine, the man suddenly felt a chill. He noticed his breathing was shallow and his heart rate accelerated. Okay, that's one way to focus uh, in, in terms of the, the, the man doing the seeing. But I think um, I would have, if I, if I had done this assignment, I, I would have focused on the features of the lake itself. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, great. Yeah, uh, but uh, that was good. It was it was good. Uh, you, you chose one way to do it. I'm just uh, suggesting how I uh, might have approached it. Uh, I would have made the lake look uh, very, very spooky indeed. Who wants to volunteer? And then we'll go to Q&A. Any hands up? Okay, Evelyn, go ahead. Brad burst out of the trees, 
onto a horrible vision, a wide cesspool, rank, steamy. He, hel- he stuttered to a halt, shook himself, blinked twice, looked again. Yes, water. Hmm. How did it get here? He stepped up to the edge, teetering on a mossy rock, looked into the shimmering ripples, swooned, fell back. And, oh. Go ahead. Who, who was that monster looking back at him? I didn't transition too well into that. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. You got the idea. Yeah. Who uh, was that monster? Yeah, you, you did focus on, you did focus uh, much more on the lake. And so that was a good one. Good exercise. Anyone else? Okay, any questions? Uh, um, go ahead, I think in the Q&A, uh, uh, there's some Q&A. How do you structure your timeline, decide how to approach your thoughts? Uh, back and forth, time uh, in, in time or early to late years? I don't know, I mean, um, uh, in, 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 in the collection of mini memoirs, which is what Uncle Rico's encore is, is about, my collection of mini memoirs, um, I, I went in straight chronological order, but that's just me. You, you can do both. Back and forth in time can 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 be difficult to achieve, and and because because you know, I mean, for, for example, in structuring a story, let let's say that that the scene shifts um, to 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 backstory. Okay, you have your current ongoing narrative. Uh, and then all of a sudden, there, there, there are a couple of pages of backstory, uh, and and the the great challenge that that writers face, uh, particularly writers who are starting out, is how do you indicate those shifts in time? Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Now we're going to backstory, uh, and and usually it's a, some kind of transitional work. And and if if you can't come up with our phrase, and if you can't that that indicates to the reader. Like okay, we're no longer in backstory now. Now we're we're going forward, okay. Um, yeah, you you, if you can't find an effective transitional word, I I would just use the five stars. I'll show you. Uh, if you go to the um, the five stars, uh, type your answer here. Type my answer here. Where's the five stars? Uh, or asterisks one two three four five and that, that's to indicate that that you know you're you're, you're no longer in backstory you're you're you're, you're now continuing in, in present time and and and, and moving the storyline farther okay uh kathy has one sorry no audio i wrote my strength is my empathy my weakness is how often my empathy fails the conflict between these uh, is my main internal struggle. Yeah, okay, that's 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 a good struggle to have. Okay, and a, a good struggle struggle to articulate. Um, uh, you'll have to provide examples of of, of when uh, uh, your empathy uh, uh, was at work and and when it failed. Sr. Yes, this grandpa character interests me. Your start is intriguing. Yes, I think it is. The pacing and the language of dialogue. Um, it, it, you know, I mean, it, it, to come up with a general rule, I think, is a little bit difficult. But um, sometimes I'll, I'll use, but just as an example, sometimes I, I will use my narrative to, 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 to set up a single line of dialogue or just a handful of words. I kind of put an emphasis on it. Okay. Um, but that's just my own preference in, in terms of someone who has used both narrative and dialogue. Um, Melanie Grayson, you're doing a great job. For, okay, okay, I've been here observing. Okay, thank you, Melanie. Judy Matthews, I'm having technical issues. Okay. I think they're deeply. I've written the short stories of poetry. Just beginning the process of being thinking about writing a memoir. The good thing is, Judy, that, that you and I have 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 been 
have lived long enough lives and experienced enough things uh, to have something to in interesting to say uh, about the things that we have experienced. So uh, I encourage you to to put it down on paper uh, and to begin the project of the pro project and the process of uh, putting it putting it into some kind of, of cohesive format that that that, uh, that results in a publishable memoir. Okay, Kathy. Broken Shimmers of the Dull Clouds Pierce, but oh, wow. Oh, this is the example. Let, let, let me read this to the class. The reflections were ever changing. Broken Shimmers of the Dull Clouds Pierced by Pine Needles. The incessant lapping, like the murmur of a horde of strangers who would not shut up or turn away. Unruly frigid winds constantly shifted the mirror surface, which hid black, blind, death alone. Nice work. That's nice work. Okay, uh, it gives me a clear vision of, of the lake and it's a distorted, disturbing vision. Um, okay, and from Judy. The moonlight on the water revealed undulating ripples, but there was no harmony in the pattern. He could not avert his eyes from the dark bundle that had drifted against the rocky outcropping, outcropping along the opposite shore. It was not completely stopped. It it had it was it had not completely stopped. It was not completely stopped from drifting, stuck against the rocks. Okay, good. That was good. Veracity, accuracy, the truth. How do you handle dialogue if you, one can't remember the exact words from the time one is recollecting? I'm afraid for fear of delving into the realm of fiction. Look, uh, this is your, Vince, this is your uh, recollection. You don't have to remember the exact words. It's your interpretation of an event, of uh, uh, an event. And this also exclude, includes uh, the use of dialogue. So don't, don't be so fussy about what was actually said. You, you instead want to capture the mood, whether you're doing it through narrative or you're doing it through dialogue. Have been doing poetry as a memoir, interesting, but tricky. Have you ever attempted this approach? Evelyn, uh, no, but but uh, I always, in, in, in my creative work, I always look for a poetic resonance. So, I mean, that can't help but help your, that can't help but help uh, 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 your, your, your memoir process. If you insert into the narrative or even into the dialogue elements of, 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 of poetry, uh, I think it strengthens the work, particularly uh, if, and let's assume everything goes according to plan and you get published and you're doing a reading at the local bookstore, um, it helps. Uh, if there is poetic resonance in your prose, people will pay attention. Okay. All right, I think that's it. Oh, we ended up at 2 o'clock. <laughs> okay. Um, Abe, you got any final comments? Okay, any final comments or questions, I guess? Anyone want to raise your hand? Speak now or forever hold your peace or until I'm down here again. <laughs> Evelyn, go ahead. I just want to thank you. This has been very interesting, very enjoyable. And I really loved hearing your work and the other writers' works as well. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate that. You guys have been a very attentive class. I've enjoyed it. Oh, Peter, one last thing. Uh, someone had asked a question about uh, if this would be on uh, recorded. Yes, it's being recorded and it'll be on our SFPL YouTube web uh, page. So SFPL YouTube in about a week or so. Okay, thanks, Abe. And thanks for being um, um, a helpful manager of, of, of this particular, it's kind of like a podcast. Yeah, it just yeah. It, little glitches here and there, but I think uh, it was it was a great session. I think as you hear from everyone else, I enjoyed it too. I, it's getting me wanting. Oh, I think I can do this memoir thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Give it a shot. <laughs> give it a shot. Give it a shot. I mean, you've already got one book under your belt, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's uh, that. You guys don't know, but but it's it's a classic book on on uh, uh, the political cartoons surrounding uh, the Philippine American Wars. Wonderful piece of work. I use it whenever I have a chance to uh, to use it. 
there's a chance to use it when I teach, for example, Southeast Asian or, or Philippine history. Uh, that's one of my go-to books. Anyway, um, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. And uh, have a good afternoon. Okay. All right. That was a good one, Peter. Thank Thanks. you. Okay. okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.